As our loved ones age, it's natural for us to want to provide care and support. But sometimes it's hard to know where to start or what to do. That's why in this video, I'm sharing three easy and impactful ways to support your aging loved ones, whether you live together, nearby, or far away. Each method will cover why, how, and specific strategies for the things that you can do to support your aging and loved ones in ways that really make a difference. so many patients, whether it's spouses, adult children or grandchildren, or even caring friends about how to help their aging loved ones. Here are my top three easiest ways to make a difference. There's detailed information on each so you can keep it as simple as you want or get as detailed as you'd like. Method number one, be you, otherwise known as be connected and engaged. So here's the why to do this. It provides them with a support system, a sense of belonging, and this idea that they are loved and cared for. Loneliness and isolation can have terrible effects on brain functioning and overall wellness, so connection combats that. Another benefit of regular interaction is mental stimulation. Having those conversations about what's happening in your day, what's happening for loved ones, what's coming up, keeps you cognitively engaged. Staying connected and being you helps you monitor your loved one's health and safety. Having that regular communication and interaction helps you see if there's any unusual changes or anything concerning coming up, and it can help you get care for them efficiently. Staying connected also preserves family history and this sense of legacy. Your older adult loved ones often hold a wealth of stories and ideas and information from the past that without talking to them will be lost. Staying connected lets you capture and share these memories to ensure that the family legacy is cherished and kept ongoing for future generations. So here's the how to stay connected. First, schedule regular check-ins. Set a specific day and time each week or each month. This ensures that it just doesn't go by without making it happen, and it helps to schedule a routine or a sense of consistency for your loved one. It also gives them something to look forward to. Try different communication methods. Assess your loved one's tech savviness, or lack thereof, and play with that. You can try phone calls, emails, letters, Zoom meetings. I mean, sky is the limit in terms of how we can connect nowadays. Number three, be a good listener. During conversation, listen actively. Show them that you're appreciating what they're saying and that you value them. Being a good listener helps you feel valued, understood, and cared for. Share updates and stories. Keep your loved one up to date on what's happening in your lives or your loved one's lives. Tell them what's exciting. Tell them what's terrible. They want to connect. Don't forget to discuss shared interests. If you've always shared a love for fly fishing or baking or going to the park in the summertime and looking for trillium flowers, Think about those ideas. Talk about those ideas together. Be patient and understanding. Aging loved ones might have hearing loss, memory problems, or other challenges that make communication more difficult. Be patient, speak clearly, and allow them enough time to actually express themselves. Try to involve other family members, involving other siblings, spouses, or children and grandchildren can make the experience even more rich and happy. And don't forget to plan in-person visits or outings together. Having in-person quality time really makes a difference in terms of connection for relationship. This provides more opportunities for emotional connection and shared memories. And here are specific things that you can enjoy together. Work on reminiscing and storytelling. Think back about those times in your family that everybody enjoys and remembers, or about the weird things that nobody really talks about, but they come up in your mind. You can get out old photo albums to see if that sparks memories, or ask about a person's history. You can cook or bake together. Sometimes older people don't have access or opportunity, or even the desire to do this when they live by themselves or don't have somebody to cook for. If you facilitate this idea of sharing the experience together, it can be a wonderful way to bond. 
You can use arts and crafts as a medium where you don't have to sit and talk all the time, but you can be busy doing something. Crafting, talking, sharing, and creating are all ways to connect. You can work on specific projects like making greeting cards, a scrapbook, or a memory album. Many people enjoy being outside gardening. This might be being in the garden and digging and planting vegetables and so on. It might be a little indoor herb garden that you work on together. It provides the opportunity to engage in something that's related to nature and nurture something together. You might read or listen to books together. My grandmother and I used to spend hours going through different books that she wanted to read, but she could no longer see. It was such an eye-opening experience for me to hear her perspective on these things while I was still learning about them myself. You can do puzzles or games. These activities can stimulate people cognitively, but also sometimes promote a healthy sense of competition if you are really going to take grandma down while playing Connect Four. It can be a fun and interactive way to spend time together. You could also volunteer or do community work together. This might be a wonderful opportunity to find out what your loved one is interested in and their values and ways of contributing to society while developing your own or working on a new area for you. It might be participating in a charity event, organizing a donation drive, having a garage sale, or some other meaningful act of service that you can do together. Method number two, be useful otherwise known as offer practical help. Here's why to do this. Practical help can really help people at a base level with things that improves their quality of life, provides them support, and helps them feel more independent. Here's the how to do this combined with specific examples. Offer to do daily household tasks and chores. This can take away the physical burden that people can't shoulder anymore when their bodies don't work quite as well. This can help reduce stress, make sure their environment is comfortable, and free up their time for other more enjoyable things. Specific examples include grocery shopping, where you could find out what they want, go to the store for them or with them, and facilitate the process. You might also facilitate it by ordering Instacart and having things delivered. You might offer meal preparation. If you're on site or nearby and you can go there and do it with them, that might be a wonderful sharing kind of opportunity. If that's not a possibility, but you can make things and have them delivered or drop them off, that could be wonderful. And if you're not there, eliciting the help of a meal support kind of service can be really useful for people. You might offer to clean or tidy up around the household. Those tasks can be harder and harder to do physically, especially if you have a limited amount of energy and you get tired easily. You might offer to do some yard work or gardening. Being outside, tidying up, making their space look beautiful and more enjoyable, and making it more accessible for them to enjoy themselves. Even putting up a bird feeder or two could provide hours of enjoyment for your older loved one. As I was saying, if you are not physically there to be able to do these things, you can also provide access to organizations that can. This might be orchestrated through local senior centers, area agencies on aging, or meal delivery services. Another way to provide practical support is to look into the realm of healthcare and medical appointments. This might include things like scheduling and arranging transport to a doctor's office. You might go with to provide emotional support and to make sure that things are well documented and there's good follow through. You might organize medications or help to make sure they're taken correctly. You might help people keep track of their medical records and make sure those are well organized or just provide medical help in terms of navigating the system when it becomes confusing. Another way to provide practical assistance in everyday life is to help with technology. Many aging people find it more and more difficult to keep up with the new technology and to use it effectively. By offering practical help with setting up equipment or navigating certain programs, it allows them to stay in communication with people using things like Zoom or email or texting or phone calls. But it also opens up opportunities for online shopping, online banking, and other important activities. You might troubleshoot computer problems. They're going along, it's working fine, and then all of a sudden it's not. You can be there to fix the issue. And you might ask them specific programs or applications that they want to use and they just don't know how. Sitting down and walking through it and practicing with them can be invaluable. 
You might assist with transportation and mobility support. People can face limitations in their mobility, so they can't get around as easily. They can't go places. They can't be as engaged. Offering assistance, like driving them to appointments or other obligations they might have, maybe helping with public transportation, or maybe even walking somewhere with them. You might choose to assist in a hands-on way with financial or administrative help. They might benefit from help with things like organizing their finances or paying bills. Organizing paperwork can be a challenge, setting up auto pay on things so they don't have to stress, creating a budgeting system if they need that, or seeking financial or other consultation from professionals if they need it. You can help with any of those things. Finally, you might help with home maintenance and safety issues. This could be things like installing grab bars, making sure that the lighting is good, and helping with changing light bulbs. By offering these mechanisms of practical help, you not only address these immediate needs, but you give them a sense of peace of mind. This can help people focus on enjoying their lives and maintaining a sense of dignity as they age. Method number three, be smart otherwise known as prioritizing health and wellness. Here's the why to do this. Quality of life. By prioritizing health and wellness, people can live longer, happier, healthier lives and have better quality of life. Fostering their physical, mental, and emotional well-being helps them be independent and enjoy the richness of what life has to offer. By prioritizing health and wellness, you can prevent and help manage diseases. This can lead to healthier years of life, where they either don't have a disease process or they're managing it more effectively. Regular lifestyle habits that you can promote, like healthy diet or exercise and proper medical care, reduces the risk of having other problems. Promoting health and wellness also leads to more independence and functional ability. Promoting health and wellness enhances mental well-being. Good health and wellness contribute to social engagement. The better that people feel, the more they can interact with other people successfully. Promoting health and wellness also reduces medical costs, so they don't have to be paying for the trip to the emergency room or more expensive medications. This can really help people, especially when they're on a budget. So encouraging exercise and healthy eating patterns can go a long way in this journey of health and wellness. Here's the first how combined with specific examples to support this. First, lead by example. Be a healthy role model. Bring over the salad that you're eating for lunch and bring enough for two. Demonstrate that you are following mind diet principles and eating fish for omega-3s on a regular basis. Talk to your loved ones about the exercise that you do, that the walks that you go on, the ways that you tend to your garden, the things that you do to care for yourself can be great role modeling for them to care for themselves. Secondly, make it enjoyable. Find physical activities that you both enjoy and want to do together. For the people out there who say, I've never exercised and I'm not an exerciser and I'm never going to enjoy that, well, then my advice is to find the thing you hate least. <laughs> Even putting it that way makes it a little bit more fun, a little bit funnier, and something that might be more enjoyable to do. Same idea with healthy eating. Making it more fun can go a long way in wanting to eat that healthy food rather than binging on the bad for you stuff. Don't forget to start slow and go for baby steps of progress. When you overwhelm people with big ideas and huge changes, it's often destined for failure. This relates to both exercise, don't go out and run a marathon the second day, and eating well. Don't change the entire diet. Start with one or two small changes and go from there. This relates directly to setting achievable goals. When you work together to achieve something small, there's a wonderful sense of accomplishment when it actually happens and you can reflect on this. You can always provide social support so when people want to make a change and do something different, being there to cheer them on can really help. You can also think about connecting people to local senior centers, exercise groups, or nutrition-related things where they can find support outside of you. It always helps to tailor activities to the person's specific interests. And then offering assistance and accountability can be a wonderful complement to that information that you've just given them. 
offer to help them drive someplace or get new meal plans or get the pan they don't have for making that special dish. Saying that you're going to come over next Thursday and check on their progress and talk about next steps can be really motivating for people. Remember, everybody's journey toward health and wellness is unique and is usually marked by small incremental change. Be supportive of this for them and yourselves. Now that you know three easy ways to support your loved ones in general, take any little piece and start there. But it might leave you wondering, how about their mental health? Feel free to check out my next video on quick and easy ways to help your loved ones avoid loneliness, depression, and anxiety. I'll see you there.